I'm just going to take a look at the resistance to antimicrobial drugs. Antibiotic resistance um, is a big problem, um, as we've been talking about. And once we get resistance in a population of bacteria, it can be transmitted to other bacteria. And there's two ways that that can happen. So the first way is by vertical gene transfer. Oops. And that is just when the bacteria reproduce, they're going to copy their DNA and then just pass on that antibiotic resistance gene to their offspring. Because remember, they do asexual reproduction and they just create clones of themselves. So all their offspring will have that antibiotic resistance gene as well. Um, the other way they can transmit these antibiotic resistance genes would be horizontal gene transfer. So this is very different. So with vertical gene transfer, we're transmitting genes from one generation to the next. With horizontal gene transfer, you're giving genes to somebody that's in the same generation. So you would have, for example, maybe you've got a staph bacteria here, and maybe it goes up to an E. coli bacteria, and it says, hey, I've got this really cool antibiotic resistance gene. Um, let me give you a copy of that. And it can do this process called conjugation. Um, that's one way it can do horizontal gene transfer. And it can actually just make a copy of that gene and then send that over to the E. coli. So that's what's really scary about horizontal gene transfer is that it can happen between bacteria that are not even the same species. So that's pretty scary. Um, and another thing that we can see with these antibiotic resistance genes is that these mutations can make them resistant to not only one antibiotic, but it might be multiple different antibiotics that they could become resistant to. Um, these resistance mutations just happen randomly. So they're just spontaneous. They're not caused by the antibiotics at all. So antibiotics do not cause these resistance mutations. But giving antibiotics to the patients allows natural selection to occur. So the antibiotics will now select for those bacteria in the patient that naturally have this mutation that makes them resistant to the antibiotic. And then they survive and reproduce and then pass on that mutation. So here's just an example of this. So we've got these bacteria here where we've got some variation. And some of these have resistance genes in them. They've just randomly had a mutation like these darker red ones. We give the patient an antibiotic and those bacteria that are resistant, they are able to survive. And the rest of them die off, but the resistance ones are able to reproduce and all their offspring will be resistant to that antibiotic as well. This is a rather scary chart. It just shows different antibiotics over here and the year that they were first used. And then the last column shows the year that we first discovered bacteria that were resistant to that particular antibiotic. So you can see, for example, penicillin was first started to be used in 1943. And only three years later, in 1946, we started seeing bacteria that were resistant to penicillin. So that did not take very long. Uh, if you look at methicillin, 1960, we started using that. And a year later, in 1961, we found MRSA. So that did not take very long to select for MRSA. Um, some of these antibiotics were not used as often, like look at vancomycin. So that one was first used in 1956, but we didn't see resistance to that until 1988. And so the less you use an antibiotic, the less chance you're going to select for resistant bacteria for that antibiotic. And so it takes longer to, to see resistance to it. So 
the more you use an antibiotic, the quicker we, we're going to see resistance to it. And so the vancomycin, um, originally it was just in an IV formulation, and that's not something you would prescribe to patients to go home with. You'd only use it in the hospital, so it wasn't used very often. And so we didn't get a lot of res resistance to it in, uh, for quite a number of years. Superbugs are bacteria that are resistant to many antibiotics, and that's what's happened to MRSA. So MRSA has now developed resistance to vancomycin, and now we have VRSA. So we've actually traced this back to a patient in Michigan in 2002. This patient is a, was a diabetic and had kidney failure from the diabetes and was undergoing dialysis. And this patient had both MRSA and also vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. And what happened in this patient is that the MRSA bacteria and the VRE bacteria, they got together and they did this horizontal gene transfer, okay? And the way they did this horizontal gene transfer is they did conjugation, which uses the sex pilus, this little protein too. And these VRE bacteria had a gene that made them resistant to the vancomycin. And so they went up to the MRSA bacteria and said, hey, let me give you this copy of this really cool antibiotic resistance gene. And they passed over to MRSA the vancomycin resistance gene. And that's how MRSA became VRSA. And now we've got this highly resistant Staph aureus that's very difficult to treat. And we used to use vancomycin to treat MRSA, and now we've got Staph aureus that we can't even treat with vancomycin anymore. So it's resistant to that. All right, so this is really important. Um, I want you to be able to tell me on the exam at least two of the causes of antibiotic resistance. So be able to tell me in this red box two of the things that we are doing to cause antibiotic resistance. So the first thing, um, inappropriate prescribing practices. So this is where physicians are prescribing antibiotics for viral infections. So remember that antibiotics only get bacteria and they're not gonna get a cold virus. But patients come in for a cold and everybody wants a pill to fix their problem. And so the doctors cave in and prescribe an antibiotic even though they know it's not gonna fix the cold. Well, the problem is, is that that antibiotic will expose all of the microbiome in that patient to that antibiotic, and we're gonna kill off the ones that are susceptible to the antibiotic and then select for the ones that have a resistance mutation to that antibiotic, and then they survive, reproduce, and now you've got this resistant population of bacteria in the patient. So we need to educate patients and tell them to stop doing that and tell doctors to don't give, give in to the patients. Unregulated sale of antibiotics. Um, that's a problem more in developing countries. So for example, you can um, go to a pharmacy in Mexico and just walk up to the pharmacist and say, hey, I want some amoxicillin. I think I've got a UTI and I wanna treat it. And they will give you an antibiotic without a prescription from a doctor. Um, so that is not a good thing to do because how do you know what you've got and what antibiotic is going to work and which bacteria you have? You have no idea. So we need to stop that because that's a big cause of resistance. And then another cause of antibiotic resistance is patients not completing their full course of antibiotics. So maybe they're supposed to take the antibiotic for 10 days, but maybe after five days, they're like, well, I feel great now. I, I, I think I'm going to stop this antibiotic and not take the rest of it. Well, that's a problem because you need to take the whole 10 days to kill off all the bacteria that were causing the infection. And if you stop too early, you're gonna leave those ones that were a little bit more resistant and then they survive and reproduce and, and that's a problem. 
um, use of suboptimal antibiotic dosages. So this is um, more of a problem with patients that don't have good health insurance. So maybe you have a patient who gets frequent UTIs and they're like, well, you know, I've got a UTI and I know I'm probably going to get another one in a couple months and um, I don't have health insurance and this is expensive. So I think, you know, instead of taking, you know, two pills a day of the antibiotic, I'm just going to take one pill a day and save the rest of it for the next time I get a UTI. Well, if you're only taking half the dose, you're not going to kill off the infection and you're going to leave the ones that were a little bit more resistant to the antibiotic, those are gonna survive and reproduce and then you get a resistant infection. And then the last one that's a cause of antibiotic resistance is using antibiotics as animal growth enhancers. So this is in food animals. Um, they are actually putting low levels of antibiotics in animal food um, to increase their growth because if you can get the animals to grow faster, you can get them to market faster and you can make more money because you don't hang on to the animals as long and you're not spending as much money feeding them. And so um, it's a lot of uh, farmers have been doing that for, for many years. Um, I think it's like been since the 40s or 50s. So that's a huge problem because if you're feeding animals low doses of antibiotics, you're exposing all of their microbiome bacteria to, you know, low levels of antibiotics and you're selecting for the resistant ones. And then those resistant bacteria end up on the meat. And if you don't cook the meat well enough or you don't wash your hands, you can ingest those resistant bacteria and get an infection from that. Or the resistant bacteria end up in the water supplies or they end up in the air um, and then that can infect humans so so make sure you can tell me two reasons or, or two things that we're doing to cause antibiotic resistance on the exam and this is just showing um, the use of fluoroquinolones in antibiotic um, this was first used in humans um, in the 1990s early 90s um, or sorry, uh, late 80s. Um, and then we actually started using this in poultry um, as a growth enhancer um, in the mid 90s. And that actually caused more antibiotic resistance. And they actually outlawed it for use in poultry because of that. Um, and uh, I think it was around 2005. So, um, so they have stopped the use of some of these antibiotics as growth enhancers in uh, food animals, but not all of them. Um, and we do need to do more of this to, to stop the use of, of antibiotics like this. Okay, and then the other thing I want you to know and be able to tell me on the exam is be able to tell me two ways to fight antibiotic resistance. What, what are two things that we can do to fight antibiotic resistance from occurring? Um, the first thing is you only want to use antibiotics when necessary. So you don't want to be using them for viral infections, for example. Um, but if you do have a bacterial infection, you, you can use them then. But otherwise, you know, you don't want to use them if, if you don't need them. We only want to try to use the narrow spectrum antibiotics because um, you only want to get the, the bacteria that are causing the problem. Um, and you don't want to be exposing the other bacteria to you know, broad spectrum antibiotics that's, you know, going to kill everything. You know, you just, you don't need all that. Okay, that's overkill. Um, for some of our bacteria that are resistant to a lot of antibiotics, um, we end up using two or more antibiotics at the same time. And that's because if you use two or more antibiotics, it's going to be hard for them to be resistant to two or more drugs. And so you're more likely to get rid of the infection and not develop resistance with that. So that's something else that we're doing. Um, and then just making sure that patients are taking the full dose, um, you know, that they're not, you know, skipping doses or taking half the dose. You know, and a lot of that's stress addressing our health insurance um, problems in the country. Um, and then educating patients to make sure they take the whole course of the antibiotics. So even if they're feeling better, they need to finish all the pills. Don't stop early.
uh, regulating the sale of antibiotics. So making sure that um, other countries are requiring a prescription from a doctor um, in order to get an antibiotic. And then also regulating um, antibiotic use in food animals. So they are starting to crack down on this in the US, um, but there's a lot of uh, lobbyists um, that oppose this from the food animal industry. And so um, it is something that um, more work needs to be done on. Um, they're much farther ahead of on us uh, in Europe on this, um, as far as outlawing the antibiotic use in food animals in Europe. So. Um, and then we need to kind of think outside the box, too, because, you know, a lot of drug companies aren't developing new antibiotics. So, you know, looking into using these viruses, bacteriophages, to treat bacterial infections, um, using CRISPR, um, you know, cutting out the antibiotic resistant genes from the, the bacteria would also be another option um, to get rid of the infection. So. There are four basic mechanisms by which bacteria can be resistant to different antibiotics. One of them is that they can produce enzymes that can inactivate the antibiotic. A great example of that would be the bacteria that are able to produce the beta-lactamase enzymes. So those enzymes are able to break down the beta-lactam antibiotics, and then they're no longer able to work. And then another mechanism would be preventing the entrance of the drug into the bacterial cell. So a good example of this would be the gram-negative bacteria. So in general, they're going to be more resistant to antibiotics than the gram-positive bacteria. And if you remember, what is it about their structure of their cell wall that makes them more resistant to antibiotics than the gram-positive bacteria. And hopefully you remember that the gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane. I remember that's right outside their cell wall, and that actually prevents some antibiotics from even entering the bacterial cell. And if the antibiotic can't get into the bacterial cell, it can't work. So then the gram-negative bacteria would then be resistant to that antibiotic. Another mechanism that can cause antibiotic resistance would be drug efflux. So this is where the bacterial cell has developed a pump that will pump the antibiotic out of the cell. So the antibiotic will enter the cell and then the bacteria just spits it back out. So an example of this would be the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis is able to do this. So the bacteria that causes TB is actually resistant to a lot of different antibiotics and one mechanism that it might be resistant would be that maybe it has a pump to spit out the drug you know once it gets inside and so if it spits it back out then it can't do its job and then it, the bacteria is resistant to that antibiotic and then the last mechanism for antibiotic resistance is what if the bacteria has a mutation and now the drug's target is now a different shape and now the antibiotic can't bind to its target anymore so maybe, for example, the topoisomerase enzyme changes shape. So there's a mutation, and some of the bacteria, their topoisomerase enzyme changes shape. Well, now the quinolones can't bind to the topoisomerase enzyme, and so now they're going to be resistant to the quinolone antibiotics. Or maybe they have a mutation and the shape of their ribosomes changes. And so now maybe they're resistant to, for example, aminoglycosides. So 
there's a couple different um, things that can be changed with the drug's target and that can make them resistant. This picture is just from your book and it just shows the four basic mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. So the first one down here on the bottom left, we talked about how some bacteria can produce enzymes to chew up the antibiotics, so maybe like a beta-lactamase enzyme. And then over here on the top right, we talked about how some bacteria can prevent the antibiotics from even getting into the cell. So maybe like it's a gram-negative bacteria in the outer membrane is preventing the antibiotic from even getting in. And then we talked about how some bacteria have pumps that can spit the antibiotic back out. So as soon as the antibiotic enters the cell, they pump it back out. So some bacteria like Mycobacterium tuberculosis are able to do that. And then some bacteria will maybe have a mutation and maybe they modify the target of what the antibiotic is gonna to bind to. So maybe they change the shape of the topoisomerase enzyme or maybe they change the shape of their ribosome and then that'll prevent certain antibiotics from binding to those and then maybe they're resistant to like a quinolone or aminoglycoside and then that will make them resistant to those.